Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey. We're going to continue the 100 best comics of the century today, counting down the top 50. But before we dive into that, Ed, give us an update on Red Room. Comics journal publisher, Fantagraphics. Red Room publisher, Fantagraphics, man. I can't disable the power of the label, Jimmy. Red Room is about murder on the dark web for fun and profit. Three issues are on the stands as of this recording, and uh, we just got the numbers back for issue four, Jimmy. Sold more than issue number two, so i got to thank you in a big, big way. That's the greatest bit of news I've heard in months. It is such rare air yes. where these comics <laughs> later on you know, continue to build sales, so congratulations, Ed. That Ed, is awesome. Ed, if you told me you levitated this morning, <laughs> I'd be less surprised than on issue four doing that kind of business. We don't get it twisted, man. There's these great Jim Rugg variants that help boost those numbers, and uh, certainly not ignorant to that fact, but I want to thank the Kayfabe community for, for supporting the comic uh, in, in a big way. Uh, if you haven't checked out Red Room, every issue is completely self-contained. Go to your local comic shop, scoop it up, order it from Fantagraphics, or hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks for the archive there, and you can read all these comics before they hit paper. We're into a fifth issue uh, as we speak, man, but there's going to be plenty of Red Room news in the forthcoming future. Tom, what do you have? Here's Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. It's the story of Jack Kirby's life in, in the comic book form, the form he worked in, drawn in pencil, just, just like the way Jack Kirby worked. Um, and then I also have Fantastic Four Grand Design, which is kind of a companion piece to it, uh, working on, you know, Jack Kirby's signature book, uh, you know, and, and um, doing like a, a condensed version of the entire Fantastic Four mythology from start to finish. I also have a, a YouTube channel called Total Recall Show, and uh, check out my Patreon. Uh, go to patreon.com and search Tom Scholey to see the comics I'm currently working on. Jimmy, you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics like this collection of my wrestling art. Uh, it includes ballpoint pen drawings, pen and ink, comic book covers, all that good stuff. I have about a dozen of these PDFs that you can download out-of-print things. You can see a lot of my original art on Patreon. You can see how I make the comics I make, including scripts and notes and Thumbnails, layouts, all of that stuff, and more. Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Pick it up where we left off. Exactly. Last week. A uh, little preamble is just, you know, this comes out to cover the top 100, basically, North American releases uh, in 2001, I believe. In 1999 is the publication date on this one. So uh, they assemble a list of their writers to put together their own list, and they put those lists together to kind of create what makes their top 100. We covered the first 50 in a previous video, so you can go back and find that on Cartoonist Cafe. Put, put a link in the description directly below this video so they can hit that. Yes, easy access. But uh, we're going to pick up today. I actually said the top 50, but we actually covered down to 49 last week, uh -huh. uh, dropping off with Understanding Comics. So we'll be starting with number 48 here today. You know what? Off the top of the bat, real quick, man, just got some feedback. You know, been working with uh, with Eric Reynolds, co-publisher at uh, at Fantagraphics, and he and he hit, hit me up after we're checking out the uh, the video and was just like really brought back to that moment. You know, this is uh, the swan song kind of, of 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 Tom Spurgeon at the Journal, mm. and he talked about just the effort that Spurgeon went through to try to make this a very, very solid list that could stand the test of time with with very little kind of kind of chaff or, or like topical, you know, timely mm -hmm. things. You know, you know how like uh, the 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 way the Academy Awards work sometimes yeah. is like you try to try to put your your movie out like right before the awards come out so it's fresh in people's minds. Recency right? bias. There it is, man. Uh, you know, so we try to be very, very specific very analytical and this is a good issue for everybody to get because beyond this list there are other lists from other cartoonists that are really awesome they are there there's definitely some uh some lists that i want to show some books from those lists and in, in you know future episodes for sure i'm glad you make that note ed because this is a cool list in that i don't know who the cartoonist is that's really knows all 100 of these like right. you, you know no matter how much you love comics or what your entry point is or what brings you to this channel there'll be some new things that you see in this list great way to start off this list jim james <laughs> thurber yes james thurber uh one of these cartoonists uh, of sort of an editorial i don't know what the right word is for these kinds of comics these one panel kind of comics they call them cartoons right? but uh new yorker cartoons definitely a blind spot in my mind but james thurber you have some connection to ed i do man uh he was born and I guess raised in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and I I did the uh, the uh, Columbus Museum of Arts 
graphic novelist residency out there. You get to stay at James Thurber's boyhood home for, for three weeks, a giant mansion, like not far from, from the museum. So when I'm uh, getting prepared to go out there, you know, they get me my rental car and all this kind of stuff, man. So I got to, you know, it's back in those days where I, I got to print up my MapQuest directions. You know what yeah. I'm saying, man? <laughs> so you go into Google, type in James Thurber house, and you know how there are those like popular searches that come in a drop down menu when, when you uh, type in something into Google? James Thurber House Haunted, <laughs> James Thurber House Ghost, the James Thurber House Ghost Hunters Season 3, Episode 4, and I'm like, what the fuck am I walking into? I watched the episode the day before I had to go out there, scared the shit out of me, went out there, every worker, every uh, janitor or like uh, maid is fucking skittish as hell, so you turn the corner... And they're jumping, and they all have a story. And that first night that I stayed there, I shit you not, uh, there was scratching in the wall that I'm going to say is just squirrels. And uh, the alarm clock right next to the bed went off, and it wasn't plugged in, <laughs> but it did have batteries in it. So I'm going to just like chalk it up for that shit. And uh, I did find a door... Two weeks into the thing, to a spiral staircase that went downstairs that I didn't know about or find <laughs> before. So that place <laughs> is fucking crazy. And and the ghost is not James Thurber. The the ghost is a ghost that he saw when he was a kid. Uh, it was a talent jeweler who caught his wife cheating, killed her, killed himself in the house. And there you have it. Man. I assume they have to disclose that to you before you show up. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> well, yeah, ha haunting. There's no such thing as ghosts. <laughs> Yeah, they did not. Uh, 47, Budley, Buddy Bradley stories by Peter Baggs. So Neat Stuff and Hate would have been uh, where these ran through. I, You know, uh, very few comics make me laugh out loud, and Peter Bagg is one of the guys uh, to do it. He his, his writing is super sound. Like, he could have, if he wasn't a cartoonist and didn't want to be a cartoonist, could be one of the great sitcom writers of his generation. Yeah, really funny. I think of him as like that Mount Rushmore uh, for Fantagraphics yeah. cartoonists mm -hmm. with Hernandez Brothers and Klaus. And, uh, you know, hate is, is where I come in on on, uh, on Peter Bagg when I start reading alternative comics and stuff. And it's just, this is a, this is a picture of a type of comics. And uh, it's aged well. I think they put out a complete collection recently, but a phenomenal cartoonist. And I think most people talk about his writing. I love his art. Yeah. It's extremely stylized and it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's a callback because I don't even know who his influences are directly, mm -hmm. but it just has all of these characteristics that are cartoonish and outlandish and unique stylistically to him. So all around exceptional cartoonist. I always like, you know, he's, he's associated with the grunge mm -hmm. movement in the Pacific Northwest and there's all this like sort of anti the man kind of like anti corporation stuff all this kind of stuff so i like always like steeped peter bag the man at like as having like the the buddy bradley bradley like ethics or something but then like when pete was doing comics about like mmorpgs like second life and stuff i'm like is this the same guy <laughs> like like what is that and, and you know what it is is just he's just he remains observant constantly he's not like like me like i don't Ask me what a kid, sort of like a teenage fashion, is right now, and I'm still going to draw Bosch jeans <laughs> and like shit like that. Right. But, but he like keeps his eyeballs open and is very observant. It comes through in his comics. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, not to get too far away from these, but you know, you think of him editing Weirdo and stuff. Like, yeah, quite quite a career in a lot of different directions that he goes in. Uh, number forty six, Cages by Dave McKean. This was an early alternative comic that I got hold of. I bought a random issue at a flea market for a quarter. Mm -hmm. And they're magazine size. They're like two color printed black and maybe a blue or something. And I had never seen anything like it, never read any comics like it. And uh, just luck that it got, you know, on my short stack when I was still starting out and able to pour through that and have come back, you know, have slowly put together that collection. But remarkable. It's, it's about an artist. It's definitely a comic that is atypical of what I was seeing, even in alternative stuff. If you think of like Fanagraphics and D&Q as kind of alternative, Cages was even different than that. Yeah. And it's a Tundra book in the beginning. So, you know, part of that kind of uh, fun legacy uh -huh. as well. Yeah. Not the uh, not the first Dave McKean book on this list, man. Uh, Mr. Punch was on their uh, collaboration with Neil Gaiman. And, you know, those are 
these are all the sort of woodshedding pieces that lead to his associate, like creating Coraline, which probably is taking care of him for the rest of his life. Covers for Sandman, stuff like this, man. Uh, so super cool. And and actually one of those comics that we need to do probably yes. a deeper dive on. I agree. And they're very nice too, because you get to see his like pen and ink work. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know, so much of his work is mixed media or painting and uh, the guy can draw like incredible drawer. So uh, very fun for that reason. 45, Paul Oster's City of Glass by Paul Karasik and David Mazzucchelli. Honestly, every bo- every every entry in here is worthy of a Cartoonist Kayfabe episode. Yeah. So I'll try not to say every time that, you know, we need to do an episode. But this is definitely a book that I've been itching to revisit because it's another one that I got early, you know, after seeing Batman Year One and, and mm-hmm. seeing Mazzucchelli as this guy. I got hold of this, came out in 94, and I probably got it in the late 90s. Fascinating comic. He draws in different styles to approximate sort of the literary devices of the original novel. I think Paul Karasik has a lot to do with that. I think he was doing layouts, so it's a lot of, uh, artistically, it's not just Mazzucchelli that's coming up with these ideas, but in terms of, like, comics art and how different styles could indicate different things, this is one of the first books that I remember having that impact where it's like, oh, shit, you know, like, this whole tone and scene and meaning is different because he's drawing this part different than last chapter. You talk about woodshedding, and it feels like this one is tilting towards Asterius Polyp. Like, totally. we're getting there. Yeah, he's going to go on to Rubber Blanket uh, after that. The text is very interesting uh, in that it kind of describes some of the things that make it stand out uh, amongst, you know, all other, you know, novel adaptations and, and, and stuff like Like, you know, there, there aren't any other kind of novel av- adaptations in this list. And uh, the text describes it as like a companion piece to the actual book. So you read the book. You read this completely different tone makes makes perfect use of like the comics medium in the same way that the novel, you know, uses prose for 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 all it's worth. So it's a companion piece rather than just like a straight up adaptation, which I think you know is is very noteworthy. Certainly in this era right now, where uh, the big publishers are seeing the numbers that comics are doing well while their prose shit is doing nothing, so they get just jobbers to you know <laughs> do, do literary adaptations. Maybe you got to take a take a piece from this man and and uh, you know stretch the medium rather than just cash a check. Also worth anybody who's interested in adaptations, whether they're you know film to book or vice versa or comic from movie, whatever the case may be, is an adaptation fascinating. Yes. So maybe watch uh, adaptation and then yes. give this thing a read. <laughs> Number 44, The Idiots Abroad. That is a storyline from The Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers by Gilbert Shelton and Paul Mavridis. Mavridis, I heard. Yeah, that's one that I can never pronounce and doesn't look that way in print. Mavrides. Right, that's, that, that was how you know eight year old Eddie P said it. I love Gilbert Shelton's art. Yeah, he was mm-hmm. one of those underground guys. Like whenever I found his work, it just spoke to me. Like you know, this guy can really draw. Like yeah. amazing, intricate, detailed drawing, very obsessive looking. And the uh, the Freak Brothers are sort of his signature characters. Been around for for decades at this point. Uh, animation's been in work for decades <laughs> at this point. But a very interesting cartoonist, and it's kind of cool to see one storyline singled out as being, you know, worthy of this list and very highly placed at 44. So there's compendiums of this stuff. You can definitely find it. And I think uh, Fantagraphics has t- taken taken the mantle of doing a new edition of, of reprints, probably, to, you know, capitalize, like, the cast is set. Like, Woody Harrelson's playing some character or something. <laughs> of course so, probably is. this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fat uh, Freddy, man. Show some respect. <laughs> <laughs> Number 43, The Amphigory Books by Edward Gorey. Uh, Gorey, another one of these guys that, in my limited mind, I kind of would equate with, like, uh, Charles Adams or something, you know, as being the, this guy whose style is so great it almost extends through several different different audience entry points at the very least. But Gorey being a guy who's perfectly suited for comics and what we think of comics and may not even be a cartoonist in mm-hmm. the in the classic sense of the word, but you can't ignore his art as, a, say, as, a, as a fan of comics. Like where does Scott McCloud put him on the yes. in, in in the rubric and stuff? Terrible printing on this thing, uh, be, because uh, the the sort of rapidograph line that Gory uses, I think he draws two sides. I think that that's like one of his shticks, and it's a very very you know subtle line that is really getting muddied here on this paper so that's not a like if you're not familiar with edward gory i would suggest like like google it because this this piece is what you call it dot gain too much dot gain 
It's yeah, like a, you're, you're right. Not the best example, probably, of his work. But, you know, if you read this entry, they're basically just saying, go check out Edward Gorey's work. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would say the same thing, because you can find these books. You know, a lot of them are, are uh, large print numbers, or they've gone through several printings. They've been collected in different editions. So not a hard guy to find some of his work. And I would say start with whatever you find. Yes. You know, you can find it in libraries. You could find it in, in bookstores. Uh, but a, but a, definitely a noteworthy artist and somebody that cartoonists can certainly pull from. Number 42, Ghost World, Dan Klaus. Uh, I, we talk about Dan Klaus quite a bit on here. Uh, Ghost World was a serialized, I guess, graphic novel or collection of kind of like short pieces that, that made up a novella. Of course, was adapted by Terry Zwigoff as a, as a movie. But um, in my mind, this, this is where he takes a step. You know, yes. he levels mm -hmm. up with this. If you read a lot of uh, Dan Klaus, he would do... Um, sort of narrative, uh, you know, like narration. Right, yeah. And when he gets to Ghost World, that stops, and it's all character dialogue, which is something he's known for, you know, something he's, he's praised for as a screenwriter, uh, but as a cartoonist, just a really interesting, if you read a bunch of his work and come here, it's like, man, he can do a lot. He was, uh, his strips were kind of like snarky, making fun of people, satirical, and this time he's 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 getting into into character, like really studying character, and that's that's what these stories are they're, they're character studies like if you want a synopsis of the plot like hmm. that just that just doesn't quite exist and you know what it's the text here that sort of illuminated cast a little light on the 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 title ghost world because uh they describe it as like the ghost world is all of this stuff from the past be it her childhood heirlooms the strength of their friendship when they were younger and it's all this stuff that's like an apparition of like the modern day that the girls are experiencing, like, while you're reading the comic, and every, like, I mean, if we go back and check it out, like, maybe every strip has some element of, like, what came before mm -hmm. in in that story, so, so like, I guess I never really put too much stock into, like, what the title Ghost World meant, but the text here uh, kind of casts a good light on that. Yeah, I'm a big fan. I love it graphically, too. That stuff about, like, nostalgia and childhood, I never even connected that, and now I'm running through chapters in my head, and I'm and it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. that's a really... Old record. Quite an insight. Yeah. When can I get, where can I get records like this again? Uh, Punk zines. At one point, she even dyes her hair, and, and uh, Rebecca has to make fun of Enid for, for looking like that old punk. The garage <laughs> sale. Oh, that's not for sale. Right. Like, like, it's out there for sale, and then when somebody, like, the idea of parting with her little stuffed animal or something, oh, no, 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 that's like, you know, $600. Yeah, I'm sure we'll look at that one, too, at some point. A fantastic piece. Uh, From Hell, number 41, Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell. In October, we went through this for Halloween. You know, uh, kind of, I think, four parts we broke it up into. Yeah. Uh, one of the astounding graphic novels of, you know, the, the rise of the graphic novel in terms of selling it in bookstores, I feel like From Hell was one of those, like, poster children for mm -hmm. what a graphic novel was. I think they spent about 10 years serializing this through different... Uh, different channels until they had the whole book complete and put it out in one giant book and I don't even know what to compare it to in terms right. of like really in-depth and the perfect pairing of writer and artist Eddie Campbell is, is you know as celebrated as Alan Moore is and rightfully so to me Eddie Campbell brings so much to this book several of Alan Moore's great successes I feel like the artists get shortchanged a little bit mm -hmm. because, like, they're phenomenal pairings. Yes. I don't want to see Eddie Campbell do Swamp Thing or Watchmen, <laughs> but I don't want to see anybody else do From Hell. Like, it is, it, it's it's what you want in a graphic novel. You know, it's not lopsided on one side of mm -hmm. writing or art. It's like two master craftsmen really syncing up. Relatively speaking, uh, I think the complete book came out when I was like nineteen or twenty, something like this, man. Uh, so at that point, they were working on it for half my lifespan. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was like, what, what's that one animation? Uh, um, the Thief and the Cobbler. You ever, or it's like, whole animators like worked 30 year careers on this film before, and it didn't even come out in their lifetime and shit. Like, it, it has that kind of gravitas to me. And he, Moore has several of those kinds of books that were just in the hopper for years and years and years and years before they saw the light of day. If if they saw the light of day, because, you know, he had a lot of irons in the fire and a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that didn't quite quite stick. Yeah, very true. But thankfully, this one did. And and the cells of this thing, like the way the kayfabe worked around it, changed over time. So, like, when, like, Top Shelf got it, you could, re you could read stuff about uh, how it's the most literal interpretation of uh, the, the, the white chapel, like the, the most plausible and all that. And when we were going in through Wizards, 
it was never set up to be that way, ever. It was just, you know, a very well-researched uh, interpretation with some good arguments and, you know, so, uh, sources cited. It's funny, whenever I look at this book now and you think, like, 10 years is an eternity, I think, like, I couldn't do that in 10 years. <laughs> no, like, in a weird way, it's like, man, that's... And they also did other books during yeah. that time? Yeah. Unbelievable. This is going to be a really funny spread once uh, Idiots Abroad or once Freak Brothers is a movie where it's like, well, this is the movie adaptation spread. <laughs> right. <laughs> there might be a few of those. Tinder Kids, Lionel Finnegar, uh, early newspaper cartoonist. Uh, you know, you think of that first generation of newspaper cartoonists working on broadsheets, and these were like fine artists. There wasn't a cartooning school. There wasn't uh, examples where these guys are like, I'm a Roy Crane student, you know. They were inventing the language. And so uh, Finnegar, one of the early pioneers that's really praised for just being beautiful, beautiful Sunday pages. And I get, I get him and another cartoonist from that era confused. Did he go back to Germany and participate in the Bauhaus he was the, he movement? Was the, he was the very first. No, no, not as a photographer. Like his photography, he kept private and only showed friends or something. But he was like the first instructor at the Bauhaus, okay. uh, had had a tremendous fine arts career as a painter, very expressionistic, expressionistic stuff, and, you know, all the angle, all the stuff you could, th you imagine with Bauhaus, but mostly uh, focusing on the triangle in, in my mind's eye, and uh, the photography stuff uh, was something that he didn't put out there. Uh, I'm publicly. trying to think of where these reprints can be found. I feel like Sunday it's, Press has done some, I don't know if they did a dedicated book, there's some in the news, in the uh, Smithsonian. Smithsonian newspaper collection. That's probably where I first you know, saw them and appreciated them, but yeah. phenomenal could, could draftsmen. It, could it be an art out of time as well? It's possible. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely a cartoonist, like I said, who's very celebrated for that, you know, that first generation, that first decade of newspaper comics, and rightfully so, man, his Sunday pages. Go take a look at those. The editorial cartoons of Pat Oliphant, 64 to present. I call him Oliphantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard you say that quite a, quite a few times, Ted. <laughs> uh, this is, again, you know, getting into editorial, just, just an area that I have a lot of uh, blind spots. So I use some an entry like this to teach me a little bit about Pat Oliphant. He was I, the big guy in, in our lifetime, like as kids, when, when newspapers existed and it came out every single day, like he was... A dude that they would talk about a lot. I love thinking about these kind of cartoonists in the context of newspaper cartoonists, like a daily strip artist, because mm -hmm. like these, they are essentially daily. You know, when you say sixty-four to present, it's like this guy literally has comics virtually every day for decades. It's incredible. What a body of work. Yeah, this. I mean, this list assembled by Tom Spurgeon, and like Tom Spurgeon's dad was like a newspaper man and stuff. So I think like he's that blind spot you're talking about is he's probably very keyed in on that stuff. That was something I always enjoyed reading Tom. If he was writing about a cartoonist of that sort, it seemed like he definitely knew and, and understood that world much better. So some of his writing that always stood out to me makes me wonder. Yeah, not his initials on this one, but uh, that's the other part that's fun with this list is who's writing what. You a lot know, of the, good the, writers. The only uh, complaint that I have with the whole list is like. The key is at the end. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, limitations of a book, book format. Right? I guess. <laughs> 38, the autobiographical stories in Yummy Fur, Chester Brown. We've looked at a couple of these. We looked at a couple of like the single issues, like the Helder issue of, uh, of Yummy Fur. These were my personal gateway into alternative comics. I got hold of them early, learned about it through Wizard. <laughs> yep, Wizard and, and Comics Journal teaming up Shouts for comics to, uh, good. Shouts to Tom Palmer Jr. for, for creating the oasis inside of that uh, fucking Wizard Desert. He opened the door, you know, like when I saw Chester Brown comics after reading about them in his column, uh, I tried them and they shocked me. And it was the autobio comics specifically that I first responded to because... Some of them are like middle school. Uh, he's got a couple of graphic novels, I Never Liked You and The Playboy, that are both younger characters. And I was reading them when I was like the character's age. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind. Like, I really didn't know comics like that. So those are huge in my mind. And I love seeing them on this list because I, I think Brown is definitely a very important cartoonist to me personally. Can't jerk off properly, though. I, th I, think, that, <laughs> I, I think the panel that... Uh... They should have used is where he's like <laughs> he's rubbing, say, rubbing his dick get, like get him, yeah. on fire, <laughs> Chester. Yeah, he's trying to start a stoke the flames. <laughs> Number thirty-seven, Doonesbury, Gary Trudeau. Here's a cartoonist that kind of straddles that editorial and daily comics. Uh, you know, talking about contemporary issues and politics in his daily comic strip. 
and celebrated, you know, virtually his entire run for that reason. And I think probably one of those cartoonists that have a wide audience for that reason. I mean, this this dude went to school with fucking George W. Bush at Yale, so he so he's a smarty pants, freaking Ivy Leaguer and stuff. Uh, my relationship with Doonesbury is very silly because there were collections of this in my elementary school <laughs> library. So there would be How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way in hardback and several Doonesbury <laughs> collections. And I'm I like comics, so I'm gonna pick these up. And I see it in in the paper in. You know, my mom reads it. She has Doonesbury shirts. My mom would have all these like Kathy Guy's white shirts, like like into, Where into, is she into, into comic stuff. Uh, and I would read these things and was just like, maybe I don't like comics. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- yeah, this like I remember when this was out in like the paper, and it's like this was like very prestigious. And like you said, like this is like people who like look down on comics. This is like the exception. Yeah, you know, that, back then, and I didn't get it either. It was like you know some characters were invisible. I think whoever the president was was invisible. Like no matter who it was, and um, like this art that they're using is is like a very early example. Yeah. But it became so like crisp and stylized and almost like rubber stamp, like very distinctive, and and like I didn't know what to make of it. Like people's noses looked like French fries, and so like he had his own visual vocabulary, which again uh, the the grown ups were, were grooving to. Yeah, and, and to this day, I mean, Trudeau, like, he he transcends comics in a big way, so he'll be a talking head on those magazine shows or, like, uh, Bill Maher or something right. like that. So, you know, he, he transcends the medium. Number 36, Calvin and Hobbes, Bill Watterson. We've done several shows on Watterson and Calvin and Hobbes. I don't have too much to add to it. You know, as we get higher up this list, it's uh-huh. sort of like... All of these choices are just, they're, they're perfect. They're, they're perfect comics. And, uh, and, you know, my thing always with Calvin and Hobbes, keep it next to the bed and read some before you go to bed at night or if you read in the morning when you get up, it'll set a tone. It'll set a very positive tone for you. And, you know, maybe when things are hard, maybe now's the time that you need that. So Calvin and Hobbes is pretty good medicine. Love seeing these Spider-Man comics by yeah. Stan Lee and Ditko uh, on the list, man. The the journal, known for some pretense here and again, especially like uh, after after Gary is is editor, like all the other editors had to like <laughs> try to try to impress Daddy and shit. <laughs> but super cool that these Ditko joints are up there. Yeah, it's interesting the superhero comics that make this list because yeah. they really sort of create a uh, you know raise the bar for like almost every other superhero comic that's going to fail. If, mm-hmm. if Ditko Spider Man is on one side of that spectrum, like yeah, what do you good put luck doing that? Teen yeah. Angst and you know Fallen Heroes and things and competing with that. But exceptional comics and cartooning and kind of cool to see it on the list for that reason because you know that superhero mythology usually trumps any kind of craft. Yeah. These are these are. High level cartoonist does in Steve Ditko. Yeah, and they're, I mean, they're, it's just like a very idiosyncratic comic. Like when when you think of like the Spider Man trademark, it's not Ditko. Like Ditko, for something as popular as it as it was, like he, he's got his own voice on it. And it's nice that so many reprints of this stuff are available. I remember getting like the essential reprints of this and just loving it. And that's what they're promoting here. Mm-hmm. And later on in the book, there's distribution stuff that Fantagraphics is doing. They're they're carrying books other than than uh, just Fanta Properties, and they have the two volumes of the Steve Ditko huh. uh, Early Essentials. Like the reverse so, payola or something. Now, I feel, now, now I feel I'm like guessing. it's wizard uh, scandals all over again. <laughs> yeah, now, now, now I'm starting to understand why a, a, a superhero comic got on a Get, Gary uh, Roth, Garib Shameless. Have they ever been in the same photo together? Yeah, man. <laughs> Theatrical Care Catchers of Al Hirschfeld. Uh, these are these are amazing. I'm a big fan of him as a drawer, and I feel like I've seen video of him drawing yes. where mm-hmm. he's like taking a pen nib yeah. the opposite direction, a way that I didn't think was physically possible to even do. But uh, a guy who like I'll get book collections of his drawings out of the library just to look at because yeah. it's just like, man, if you want to draw an ink line, you could do a lot worse than studying Hirschfeld. Yeah, this is that and thing caricature that... for that reason or for that matter too. I'm not putting you guys on the spot, but uh, just out of curiosity, do you know who these two guys are? Oh. Is it uh, Walter Matthau and uh... Jack Lemmon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The oh, odd okay. couple. I was just wondering <laughs> if you guys <laughs> were, were were tuned into that or not, because I mean, those are pretty. Uh... 
pretty cool caricatures. He, uh, Walter Matthau looks like he could almost be uh, the skipper on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got to be near that era of Bad News Bears, right? It's I always so spot on for maybe you looked that way for decades. <laughs> Riding with you guys in, in, in cars for for 20 years, I kind of call you guys the odd couple. Yeah, I, yes, yeah, that's right. And, and you can guess which one's which. <laughs> Look at how his hands are like twisted up. I feel like I do that whenever I'm sitting around. Yeah. Almost just like bending fingers around and stuff. It speaks to him as an artist, and I would also point out, like, like the hair on the arms, you know? Like, he pulls all these different textures out. Again, I can't think of a better guy with a pen nib, so if that's the kind of stuff, art you make, do yourself a favor and check those out. Something tells me that the third Nina is in those arm hairs, man. <laughs> you know the deal? Because mm -hmm. he's got the three right there, and you see the two Ninas right there, but I can't find the other one. Where is it, Kay Fabers? Nice. Yeah, that one's very pronounced, a couple of them. Yeah, both of them, these ones. Mm -hmm. That's fun. Uh, number 33, Chester Gold's Dick Tracy. I'll tell you, the more I read about comics, the more his shadow looms over everything. Uh -huh. Yeah. You yeah, know, Batman. I, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you think of Batman as being DNA for so many comic book superhero tropes. It's all out of Chester Gold's mm -hmm. Dick Tracy. What they're describing in the text here is that Dick Tracy is like the template for even like noir detectives period mm. chandler like oh, all, wow. like like all that stuff it wasn't really around before then uh obviously there was like sherlock holmes and and a couple other little things like that man but he really kind of created the hard boiled you know uh tough as nails hmm. de detective character uh and they also praise the the kind of um authenticity of some of the crime detection stuff as uh the as, procedural elements yeah this this double spread is is a lot of fun like like i'm, I'm getting feeling a lot of joy just kind of looking <laughs> at all these things together yeah this this it's how this list works you know as we get further in it's going to be it's going to be more fun tom but uh the other piece of the chester gold stuff is how many alternative cartoonists draw from him yes. you know like it really is this guy that there's a lot of chester gold dick tracy dna in con in american comics I'm, I'm looking right there at the dc treasury of uh the flat top story and that's been on my list for us to unpack for half a year at mm -hmm. least man um it's he's the one cartoonist that i read that i don't critically question at all like just whatever that's, that's a nice relationship <laughs> whatever he's given me I'm accepting, and we're at a point now where, where IDW put out the entire body of work in about 30 volumes. I have every single one, and uh, those are were event comics to me. Like, wh when a new volume would come out, nothing else is happening for uh, two or three days, man. I gotta sit down. I As a kid, I got those, like, real shitty Blackthorn mm -hmm. reprints mm -hmm. where the panels yeah. are all over the place, small, big, all that, and just ate, drank those up, but I wanted to read it all. I wanted to read all of it, and we live in a day and age where that is now possible, and I'm super thankful. It's another one, too, where, you know, like, you look at the dates, 31 to 77. It's a guy, it's a, a man's life that you right. get to read, you know? Like, it's really a chronicle of an artist that you can follow what? for it's decades. A, it's a bookshelf and a half. <laughs> Just the... watch the wheels come off the car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Oh, yeah. Uh, 32, Jack Cole's Plastic Man, Jack Cole. Uh, glad we talked about Spider-Man a minute ago. You'll see Fantastic Four coming up at number 30. I always think of that for Plastic Man because it's not a character or comics that I know well. I've read some of them. I know Jack Cole's, you know, exceptional, but it really puts in context just how good those comics are and worth tracking down, you know, whatever collections or reprints you can find of them. You get a hold of uh, Police Comics, uh, and that was the day of, like, the anthology comic uh, where couldn't imagine there being one whole... Even Superman comics had backup features, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And that's all the context you need, man, is to, is to get a reprint of, like, a police comics because everything else was so thin, derivative of, like, Daily Strip, but in comic book form. And Plastic Man was so specific, and it's, so its own universe, its own creation, and just really, really good, strong, funny cartooning. And visual. Super you know, visual. you can see it in the two panels that they show there. Uh, and I think you get that from the cartoonist, right? The guy mm -hmm. who's able to write and draw it and put the, put his jokes in the imagery. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool to see. He's relatively local. He's from like Newcastle, so like an hour or so from here. And whenever he's like 12 or something, rode a pedal bike cross country and back. It's like a Boy cool. Scout badge, you know, earning thing. But talk about a different world. That's a hardcore badge, dude. I got kicked out of the Weeblos because I played too much Sega Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, also a cartoonist that has done a lot. Like he, he did pinup art, you know, for Playboy. So yeah. uh, you, you can definitely find some uh, some interesting stuff on Jack Cole if you go down a little further. Uh, Poison River collection by Gilbert Hernandez from Love and Rockets. Is this the first Love and Rockets? I feel like there's several Love and Rockets yeah, stories all, that, we'll, that we'll get in here. Um, I don't know what else we can say about Love and Rockets that mm-hmm. we haven't said in previous episodes. What, uh, what you I know, will... One of the biggest comics in history from... I think an influential standpoint. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, what I will say is that we'll, we'll get into all the issues eventually, man. Uh, these things are profound comics. They are the best cartoonists working in America today. I, th- I think that they are because they don't sh- like stretch their stuff into like other kinds of um, story. Like it's it's Lo- Love and Rockets is is the is the is that is the house that they've built, right? And people take them for granted in a giant way. Uh, people feel like because they've been working on these comics for 40 years that it's impenetrable or insurmountable. Like, where do I begin? And the answer is just pick something up. Yeah. Just pick something up, read it, you'll dig it, pick something else up, keep going. Uh, because they just are the best guys working in comics today. Uh, we're going to have to go through, you know, this the the entire run at some point. Yeah, and, you know, if you are just picking stuff up to start with them... Make sure you pick up stuff from both creators, Absolutely. Jaime and Gilbert, because they're they're really different between the two of them, which is hard to imagine that mm-hmm. two great cartoonists grew up in the same house could have such different perspectives. The the reason we need to go through all of that stuff issue by issue is because their intuition for comics making is there from the start, and you fucking learn a couple of things every issue. Sometimes you might learn ten things in an issue of Love and Rockets that you can apply to your own practice. They broke so many rules that have become a norm. You know, like, yeah. this is this is the very first thing they start with, is how, like, serializing this complex novel over a dozen issues, which would have been a couple of years of publication, really testing your readers. But, I mean, it's become something of a norm, you know, in terms of how a lot of these comics are presented over the last couple of decades. Not Love and Rockets, but comics in general that lead to uh, the longer collection. So... A lot of stuff that they did in Love and Rockets that becomes a norm, but very cool to see them like almost inventing these different modalities. Uh, number 30, Fantastic Four comics of Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. Uh, another plug for Grand Design, Fantastic yeah. Four, Tom. Yeah, I know them <laughs> intimately. Uh, this was always the high point of uh, superhero comics for me as a fan. You know, I start reading long after this runs over, but it was always the thing that everybody pointed at, old timers and... You know, whenever reprints of that would come out, it was like, grab grab those up. I would go to uh, the, the flea market reliably. Uh, what was it called? Marvel's Greatest Heroes reprints yeah. uh, that would have the the uh, Lee, Kirby, Fantastic Fours in there. And uh, just perfect comics. For, 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 for a boy, like, I uh, just recently read This Man, This Monster. And thinking about that in the context of, like, when I first read that thing, worked perfectly on me. My film history is a little... Like, I don't, I don't, it's spotty. I don't know when Douglas Sirk was doing his thing, if it was the 50s or what, or if it was contemporary to, to this, because it has the same kind of melodrama yeah. of of those kinds of films and stuff. And, it, you know, it works perfectly. Like, it's it, it feels, you know, dated in a way now, but really dug those comics. It's interesting seeing these two side by side. I think of, like, the, I think the Art Spiegelman quote, where he's he says, like, uh, Mr. Fantastic is Plastic Man with a lot more starch. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, number 29, Frank King's Gasoline Alley. Uh, another standout comic strip, both as a daily and as a Sunday page. These have been reprinted in really beautiful editions over the last two decades. Highly recommend any of those. Uh, you know, characters aged in real life was one of the interesting things. But visually, Frank King just did I mean, it really was a canvas that he was painting on those Sunday pages. Like, different styles, amazing color palette, huge influence that you can see in, like, Chris Ware. Yeah, for sure. Uh, And a lot of different kind of storytelling styles that would... Like, Gilbert Hernandez did Julio's Day, where, like, each page, it was, like, a moment in time, uh, and you get 100 pages, so you get 100 years of, you know, this family's lineage. We're going to have to do that comic at some point. And, you know, this comic kind of set up a kind of template... For, for that kind of thing because it sounds like a MacGuffin, right? Like every every you know, the characters age in real time with with you. Uh, so each strip is a moment in time. Like, well, how how do you choose the right one? 
you know, to kind of keep things going. So that that's a that's a fun exercise to play. And uh, we still haven't gotten Dark, Dark Horse has done Sunday reprints. Um, that's uh, you know the sexy stuff that we're looking at right there. But they made the mistake of like starting from the beginning mm-hmm. and diminishing returns. And there's only been two volumes, and it's too bad. They should have started at like the last volume or something, uh-huh. so that you get a lot of the good stuff. Like kind of like with Fantagraphics, I uh, was doing with the Carl Barks, where you start off super super strong print the volumes out of order so that when you have your diminishing returns, it's on it's on kind of the weakest yeah, work. Right. It's always a struggle with these long-running series. Like, yeah. uh, what's the best way to put those out? Sunday Press put out a collection of Sunday pages at, like, actual broadsheet size that's stunning. You yeah. know, I mean, it's really like a painting on every page. And uh, Drawn and Quarterly put, put some in, a uh, like, one of their quarterly oversized magazines. So, there, like I said, there's, there's places you can find those. I'm sure there's a bunch online, but beautiful art. The Mishkin Saga, Kim Deitch and Simon Deitch. I'm trying to think of this series. I went through a yeah, Kim Deitch phase, and uh, and it's when I knew you, Ed. It would have been in the 2000s, because I can remember like us talking about Kim Deitch, and uh, he's done a lot of these different stories, and they do blur together in my head a little bit, because I end up reading them in zero zero issues, or you know all these different places, but I would recommend anything Kim Deitch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, Spurge. Spurge, man. Why didn't you put the uh, the comics that these things showed up in? You know, because I don't think there was a comic called the Mishkin Saga. You know what I'm saying? It's not in there. I was I was looking for it. He's he's a cartoonist uh, that uh, whenever I started to expand beyond the the comics that were in the local in, in the local grocery store, uh, one of the easily identifiable styles. I um, yes. mm-hmm. newest comics from Comics by Les Daniels. Uh, and that was a book that I was taken out of the library when I was still in elementary school. This is another elementary school story. Uh, in our elementary school library, we also had uh, Nickelodeon magazines. And it might have even been highlights. But I saw, like, you know, these style drawings. And it, it was clearly Kim Deitch's artwork in these little kid comics. And it made me think that I had some secret information. Because in Comics by Les Daniels, there's... Dicks and balls and assholes and vaginas and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, it's the same guy. And he's he's invaded our elementary school. It, yeah, it's worth noting that he's had such a long career. Like he goes back to those early underground comics oh, yeah. and a contributor to that. But uh, it continues to be, you know, to produce and has a very rigorous style. You know, like sometimes you'll see. I think there've been portfolios published of like his sketches and then build that into a tighter page. I don't know if it's tracing paper or what, but like he'll have layers of these pages where he's refining the pages and the drawings and uh, a lot of nostalgia, as you can see here with, I don't know if this is Wally. Waldo. Yeah, Waldo, one of his uh, ongoing characters, but based on like an old character. Yeah, you like, you see you see glimpses inside his crib, man. And it's uh, like, it's almost like that this kind of character has taken on a mystical occult uh-huh. quality because <laughs> he has so much, so many tchotchkes from like the 1800s or like the early 1900s that basically has that kind of cat face. You know, think about that like cat clock and, yeah, and shit like yeah. this. And uh, yeah, like a Felix. Yeah. Yeah, definitely somebody I'd like to look at, uh, you know, more in depth. So. And maybe the Michigan sagas, where do we, where we start? But uh, where do we find it? <laughs> uh, Palestine, number 27, Joe Sacco. Uh, Sacco is incredible. He's like a journalist in comics form. I always push people towards Safe Area Garage Day. Yeah. He was the first comic speaker I ever saw. He, he, it was at Pitt, and it would have been like 99, 2000, something like that. And uh, talking about Palestine in his talk and people like jeering him in the audience, uh, you know, not easy subject matter that he that he tackles. And like a journalist, you know, he's traveling to these places. He's doing these comics from uh, firsthand accounts, from eyewitness accounts, like real journalism in comics form has several books built that way. And I think Palestine was the first one. Uh, up to that point, I think he was doing more alternative comics, you know, music comics, things like that, and then locked into this more uh, nonfiction approach. And it's kind of been his corner since then. But I'd recommend any of any of those uh, works. They always stood out to me as being comics, unlike any other comics I was reading. Speaking about comics that are unlike any others, and let's keep things light, man. I've been watching Beavis and Butthead lately, so <laughs> I just have this in my mind. Do you think Otto Dix knew Jim Nutt? <laughs> <laughs> Number 26, Harvey Kurtzman's Jungle Book. Uh, uh, 
Kurtzman creator, mad, incredible cartoonist, and it's great with the Jungle Book because it's his hand. Often he's collaborating yeah. with an artist that does like the finished art. I like seeing Kurtzman's original, you know, his, yeah. his, his his finish. So that's a pretty cool piece. And uh, Jungle Book's cool. It's a, it was done as a paperback, yeah. you know, original format paperback because the Mads were so big, the paperback format was so big. So this is him creating specifically for that format. And there have been a couple of editions of that where you can actually see, like, the page, the lines that are ruled out. I don't know why it's printed that way, but it's really cool. Like, the kitchen sink edition uh, is the one that I have where you can really see his hand all over that page. And uh, Jungle Book collection of kind of four or five short, like, vignette novella type pieces within the story. Um, but also kind of a graphic novel, you know, yeah. like a very early 1959. So a very early version of a graphic novel, original material. Yeah. I mean, if contract with God is, is a graphic novel, then this is too, cause that's made up of vignettes also. And this was like another one of Kurtzman's like swing for the fences, like trying to do something a little more ambitious, a little more, uh, like, uh, uh, literary, a little more literary, a little more, um, rigorous and, uh, you know, not quite finding, Success just doesn't yeah. hit, man. Uh, yeah. The the Kurtzman comics uh, single issue one shot that Dennis Kitchen put out has an introduction by Robert Crumb, and where Robert Crumb is extolling the virtues. I think that same introduction may be in the Big Strange Adventures, like Kurtzman uh, book uh, that a bunch of people. I, Kurtzman collaborated with people or something. Marvel yeah, the Marvel, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like a Marvel graphic novel. Yeah, I think I think that's in there, uh, but just describes the career, you know, of discovering the Mad comics and and talking about all of these other things. Like Mad set him up to like have all of these other opportunities, but basically for the rest of Kurtzman's career, it was the kind of swing and miss thing to the point where he ultimately just was under the thumb of uh, Hugh Hefner. For the rest of his life, pretty much, man. Like in the in the piece that Crumb wrote, was just talking about like all of the editorial stuff that Hefner imposed upon those guys. It didn't seem very freeing. Yeah, I think of like his relationship with Hefner as like the patron of the arts. Exactly. Yeah. Number twenty five, Roy Crane's wash tubs. Uh, Roy Crane really has been entering my sphere lately, looking at yeah. different stuff. I love, this is a Tom Spurgeon review. The first line is, Wash Tubs is the best adventure comic of all time for one reason, it moved. And, uh, you know, like, as I'm looking at more of his work, I see the qualities that I love in, like, an Alex Toth. Uh, a phenomenal draftsman, composition, just, I, you know, I, I don't want to say cartoonist, cartoonist, because he was super popular, you know, mm -hmm. and often that means, like, a very specialized yeah. little corner. But an exceptional cartoonist in every characteristic I can think of that makes a good comic and uh, worthy of study time. You Sha see Siegel and Schuster here, and you and um, Jack Kirby cites uh, like Roy Crane's wash tubs specifically as an influence. Shouts to the K favor who sent us like ten volumes that you and I divvied up for yes. us some like a year ago. It's it re they really are like magical comics. Like I say, you know, I see Toth on those pages, and uh, and it's glorious. Number twenty four flies on the ceiling. Jaime Hernandez. Uh, so we talked about Gilbert a minute ago, Jaime, the other half of Love and Rockets. And I always would think of those guys, you know, it seems like for a while it would be, you know, Jaime's the better artist and Gilbert's the better writer. I feel like they trade stuff back and forth. Uh, you know, they, they don't rest. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't rest in terms of getting better, but pushing themselves. And so here you see uh, one of Jaime's her early successes in terms of pushing that and having a bigger, more ambitious story and really weaving in that, that cast and, you know, adding complexity to that cast that he was built, it, it continues to work with. It was a story he was almost teasing from issue number one, man, the How to Kill a story, where you see Izzy Rubens in some strips, and she's got, like, the mohawk, and she's affected. You know, she probably listens to a lot of Morrissey or The Cure and <laughs> right. shit like that. But then when you read How to Kill a, it's this, like, refined... Uh, you know, romantic vision of novelist or writer, you know, she's, she's, she's well-groomed in a, a little cabin by herself, putting pe like, you know, her hands on the keyboard, writing her story, but then clearly having some kind of like a mental breakdown or something like that, you know, took a couple years. If, if the strip started in 82, 88 to 89 is where they start to explore the origins of Izzy and how she got, got that way. I haven't peeked ahead on this list, but I have a feeling that, that there might be like at least one more Jaime Hernandez <laughs> Love and Rockets storyline that, that makes yes, the at list. Least. Yeah. About that one canceled uh, Warner Brothers character? 
You know Speedy Gonzales? <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> uh, number 23, Milk Kniff, Terry and the Pirates. Uh, Milk Kniff, I think of as sort of the, the left right of Roy Crane, Milk Kniff for defining adventure comics and black and white on, you know, in a dramatic way or a melodramatic way. I don't know what I could add to Milk Kniff. Uh, you know, you mentioned Kirby a minute ago, another Toast. guy who, right, almost everybody, this, there's, Kniff DNA and you know generations of cartoonists that followed him in comic books too, not you know not just comic strips, but really seemed to bring some different stuff to the daily comics routine, specifically his lighting and brushwork. Churros hero, exactly. Even his signature looks like Toth's, you know. <laughs> Number twenty-two, Death of Speedy Ortiz. How about that? Jaime Hernandez. Uh, this is probably the first Jaime book that stood out to me. It was one that made total sense. I understood when people were recommending or talking about the different stories. Like, this one made so much sense to me. It's young people. Uh, you know, I was young when I started finding this stuff, and it just kind of like, yeah, I have those friends that are, you know, doing things they shouldn't be doing, and most of us are lucky to get through it, but not everybody. This yeah. was a really heavy story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I like, just thinking about it right now, like, I, I do think I'm at that point now where in my life, everybody I expected or wouldn't have been surprised about dying young. I, th I think I'm past that point in life now. You know what I'm saying? And that's the, the, the feeling that this story has for me. But like Ghost World, uh, this is probably like one of the early Jaime breakthrough stories where he was thought of as like... Um, more whimsical, more poppy, more... Archie characters, right? Yeah. These, these pretty attractive characters running around and punk and sci-fi and... Exactly. Fun to look at. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you wonder, man, like, does, does he hear enough of that Gilbert's the Better Writer stuff, and he fucking licks his chops, clasps his hands together, does does the fucking Chester Brown <laughs> gimmick without the, without the tool in, in the middle, and it's like, I'm going to get to work and put together a comic that that's going to, you know, surprise some people. And it's the same deal. It's it's several years in, you know, like we know these characters. So when something happens, it feels like it's happening to a person, you know, mind blowing. Again, you're not getting this. I wasn't getting this out of a Spider-Man comic yeah, or, like, or anywhere like that. Say what you will about those like Chris Claremont X-Men's and shit like that. It doesn't, the, the characters don't move. What, 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 like a, <laughs> what about when Flash Thompson became Venom? <laughs> <laughs> That, that's my number two. <laughs> uh, 21, The New Yorker Cartoons of Peter Arno. And, uh, oh, this isn't a Spurgeon either. I know Peter Arno from Tom Spurgeon writing about him in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes he would write about these old cartoonist books, and I'll find these in bookstores, where it's like a big collection of just these single-page, you know, beautiful-looking ink wash cartoons on there. So Peter Arno, in that line of... Uh, you know, whatever those are, spot illustration cartoonist, uh, gag cartoonist, I'm not sure the exact word for it, but a uh, pretty interesting drawer too. A little Picasso-esque, some of these mm -hmm. particular images, but a, a guy probably because of this list and other places that stands out to me on, uh, you know, in that type of cartooning. And if you decide you like any of these cartoonists, you can find those books. Like yeah. there must be, I don't know, 20 Peter Arno books around, like you can find them at affordable prices. Uncle Scrooge, Carl Barks coming in at number 20. Definitely a cartoonist in comics that I think we'll look at more. Phenomenal cartoonist. Another cartoonist who lived a life and then starts brings all of that experience into making comics when I think he's in his 30s, mid to late 30s. I think he starts making these comics. And it's like world traveler, adventure, uh, you know, just all these things that you barely ever saw in one comic book he's able to do routinely story after story of just entertainment it was about respect too uh he it, none of the these comics like talk down to the uh the the reader um read any like dc comic like you know, like a superman or a batman it's a lot of that show and tell and just beating kids over the head with exactly what's going down and so like as a cartoonist there's enough reduction to the comic that that he isn't smashing you over the the head with with um you know what he's trying to get at he's he's giving you you some room to 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 take things and and, and leave it also um Paul Karasik described that like the duck characters in, in these like you know in these fifties early sixties uh they could go on all these adventures they could do all this stuff, but there's a root to each of the characters. There's like a root core to each of the characters that never gets disobeyed. And then they'll just add a piece on top of it to make them pirates or 
or, you know, uh, explorers or archaeologists or something like that. And that was like a revelation because uh, characters were just stuffed shirts like that, that, that were this one thing always at that time. So it's worth noting too the Scrooge stories, capitalism is such an important part of them. Uh, pretty complex ideas in many of those stories for kids, you know, yeah. for being aimed at kids. They, they really, you know, he's also talking about some of this other stuff through most of the Scrooge stories. Uh, number 19, the R. Crumb sketchbooks, Robert Crumb, 1964 to present. Uh, Crumb sketchbooks, legendary, Tra yeah. traded a few for mm -hmm. a house in France at one point, you know, on the, on the Crumb documentary. But uh, a guy who has saved these things, many of them have been reproduced and it's an amazing collection of documents to see a cartoonist sort of thinking on the page. I'm so happy to see these on, on this list because I do cite those sketchbooks as, as probably being more in my, on, on my list as being more important uh, contributions to the culture that then, than his actual like published comics. Uh, there's, there's way more kind of like id to that stuff. It's, we see how he draws, man, like without penciling and stuff. So, so it's, it's direct communication from his brain to the paper. So it's just, it, it feels more, even more honest and, and, uh, you know, putting himself out there. And certainly in a day and age like this, man, where people equate like art with the person, even better that we have these as documentation now, because I, I'm sure there's a cultural chilling effect where people feel like they can't even draw certain shit yeah it's incredible groth by the way is writing this so it's it's i i really like his critical writing so it's a pretty good piece but talks about it being almost a new genre because it's not any one thing it's not auto bio there are lots of comics in it of course uh ed i think your description's pretty good of like being even more of his ed, id if that's possible and uh the numbers here between 64 and 2000 it'll be over 4,000 pages and uh making those accessible to the public too is a is a pretty nice uh, it's a gift, you know, I mean, how many cartoonists would you love access to their sketchbooks and they're not giving those out? Uh, so pretty awesome that these things exist, but man, 4,000 pages in 35 years, guy is uh, drawing all the time. Li living on the page, man. Th there, this stuff's like a huge influence to like our generation of cartoonists, I feel like. like. Like, you know, we could probably rattle off a name of like maybe, you know, a half dozen people who like we're clearly emulating this this way of working. I mean, I I certainly have, have done my my version of that. Like, it, you know what it, you, we saw that documentary. Yes. And it's like I need to search out that little white pen with the yellow tip rapidograph, right? And if this is what you have to do to like be come like a great comic artist, well that's what you have to do, you know? Like he he set up a template without even trying to in that documentary. This stuff, too, has a certain gravity to it. Like, when you see a sketchbook and it's kind of loose, maybe I can do that. You know, like, I've done sketches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, I can't do this. Yeah. But, you know, it does pull you. Like, sometimes I'll see this work and it's just like, yeah, I need to, I need to work this way. I need to think this way. I need mm -hmm. to do some of this stuff. I mean, you go to a gallery space or a museum, some of the best art is not, like, refined, right. corporate, made-for-print art, you know? So, like, this is far closer to that than commercial it's very intimate it's yeah. a different way of drawing too if you do just straight to ink you know how do backgrounds grow out of figures where do you start it's it's really interesting as a i recommend as an instructional it. drawing document i recommend it it makes you a more confident pencil or so like when you're putting down those strokes man we all had a little chicken scratch sketches and then you do enough pen drawing without without a safety net you're going to get a little bit more confident with that stroke pauline or pals cliff starrett Early comic strip starts 1912, runs to 1958. So, you know, 46 years is quite a bit for these early strips that start out. And uh, I had like, I think it was Eclipse. Somebody had given me like an oversized reprint of these from the 80s when Eclipse was reprinting some of this stuff. And I could be wrong on the publisher, uh, but a really great cartoonist. And, you know, whenever you're dealing with 46 years, there's a lot of style evolution over that time period. But I can remember like seeing those reprints and... Again, Chris Ware, I feel like Chris Ware knows every comic strip, but seeing some of those influences in his work, uh, but one of the early standout comic strips, uh, without a doubt, and one that has been being printed and reprinted more, uh, again, in the last 20 years. Number 17, Acme Novelty Library, Chris Ware. Uh, not sure what we can add to the Chris yeah. Ware conversations. We have several videos on Chris Ware. You know, search search those videos out. We have sketchbooks of his. We have big oversized monograph of his. 
uh, but a cartoonist that a different voice than any other cartoonist working. Even guys who are meticulous, it's very distinct and different than, say, a Dan Klaus or something like that. Jimmy Corgan, you know, like probably his first graphic novel to come out of the Acme Novelty Library that uh, captured a wide audience. You know, that was kind of one of those early breakthrough graphic Started novels. Started the graphic novel boom kind the, of thing. The McSweeney's crowd, I feel like, really <laughs> leaned into it. But, you know, it established him that when a new graphic novel comes out, it's an event now in the literary world. And it opened comics to some of these literary audiences that may be open-minded but didn't really, weren't reading any comics. Chris Ware is the, the cartoonist they read. There's a part of him to me, it's like... Um like when Kobe Bryant was still in, in, in high school and stuff, and it was like, okay, he's going. It's just like, where is he going? Uh, I remember in the journal seeing pieces, and it might be the one with the Matt Groening cover with like Bongo or whatever on the cover, uh, where just like in the front matter, they were just talking about that kid from Texas, man, that cuts his own color separations. And, and it was some Quimby strips and shit uh, from, from his cartoons in the Daily Texan before he even went to Chicago. You know, you'd go to, um, like, Phantom of the Attic, and in the corner, they would have that cardboard yes. display of Acme Novelty Library, and it really felt like, in that store, it's like, okay, there's everything else, yes. and then there's this. Right, yeah, absolutely. There's there's everything else, there's the three long boxes in the back with the independent comics, and then there's this, like, little cottage industry of, like, Chris Ware comics, where they're all shapes and sizes, making your 1990s speculator fucking insane yes. because of like the <laughs> different, different sizes, sizes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah meticulous in every way also very prolific uh i'm sure we'll continue looking at chris ware as long as this channel exists raw coming in at number 16 we're, we're at such a point yeah. in this list i feel like we don't do any of them service you right. know you could do an hour on any of these things so we we'll try to stay work. brief but i mean raw magazine yeah it's where Chris Ware was first seen by a wide audience. You got Mouse in there. Like, it's like, you know, the greatest <laughs> hits. It's like, you know, what what are the top 100 comics? Uh, for number one, I would say all of comics. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge, huge survey. You know, those raw issues, I always say, like, those are things to track down as a collector because they're so spectacular. They're giant oversized. You know, they're completely different in a lot of ways than any comics, especially in 1980. Uh, but also, like, they're the, they're what comics are now. Yes. You know, so much has come out of there. They were bringing in European uh, cartoonists, uh, Japanese cartoonists. They were, Fletch, like, Fletcher Hanks, you know, introduction of Fletcher Hanks to a modern audience. So, like, they were pulling comics from everywhere as well as interesting new American cartoonists. And uh, it's still a who's who, you know. Like, like yes. you look at the current comics landscape and a lot of it traces back to Raw Magazine. This, this fringe thing has become the mainstream. Gary Panter, you know, we can name names again. This is an, this Raw probably couldn't be in one hour. Wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if there was like one dud or in there or something? Maybe like, there if, will be. If, if like Reed, Reed Fleming World Toughest Milk had, had a <laughs> number one seven. Or something. <laughs> oh man. Uh, number 15, Will Eisner's Spirit. Uh, Will Eisner, obviously the namesake of the Eisner Awards, doesn't get too much bigger than that. A uh, guy who's been celebrated virtually his whole career, the spirit being kind of the, the beginning part of that career. Kind of like like Hitchcock in as much as like touched every piece of the growth of the medium from the very beginning. So he had like mm -hmm. his Hawks of the Sea and, and you know his adventure strips when that was the dominant form. Started to make comics books. Had, had a studio whenever all, virtually all comic books were produced out of those studio systems. He had a studio with his name in the title. The 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 industry starts to like waver because they're only selling three hundred thousand copies of each issue of things that come out. So he pivots and starts doing work for the military. Graphic novel becomes a thing. So you know he he explores that route. Uh, kitchen sink like you know direct market stuff comes out so then he's doing like will eisner quarter quarterly where he's you know serializing maybe two graphic novels per issue and doing like a bunch of little one and done things uh you know the guy's touched it all he's he's added a lot to the vocabulary of comics so of course he should be on this list somewhere number 14 blood of palomar gilbert hernandez Number 13, Wigwam Bam. Hi, May Hernandez. Oh, this, this, this was caused to like create a rift between these two brothers. <laughs> Going back and forth. This is when I started uh, like picking up the issues like, like as they were coming out, uh, the Wigwam Bam story. And I, like, I picked up this and I picked up issue one. 
uh, you know, one issue of the, these. And to see that, like, that told me everything I needed to know about what Love and Rockets is, because Hopi and Maggie, they didn't quite look that, that way when they started, you know, a little bit softer figures and stuff like that, to- clearly growing in, like, that Frank King kind of way, and uh, fell in love, fell in love with this stuff. In Blood of Palomar, Palomar being the fictitious city uh, that I think really elevates a lot of Hernandez's early work into that novel space of just all kinds of different characters populating this city and, uh, you know, en- enough for stories for the rest of his life and beyond. Not the only place he makes stories from, but Palomar being a significant piece to come out of Love and Rockets on his side. Number 12, the war comics of Harvey Kurtzman. Um, trying there to think, you, of, you know, we've seen some of these in artist editions that we've looked at. This is around Korean conflict time period and uh, Kurtzman taking a very different look at war and war comics. Like definitely not a glorifying war kind of thing, not a patriotic kind of thing, and uh, just kind of the horrors of wars, uh, you know, war and, and humanity and what's lost in that, uh, I would say, is like the heart of those comics. In that uh, introduction that Robert Crumb wrote in, in uh, Kurtzman comics, uh, he describes them as... Uh, the, the country's only liberal war comics. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is like just <laughs> when you think of war comics as a whole, this is so separate, so its own thing. And I guarantee there's not going to be another war comic like higher up on this list. Yeah, we're not going to get Bob Kaniger and Joe <laughs> Kubert's Kubert, Sh- Sergeant, Sergeant Rock. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely noteworthy though. And again, comics you can lay your hands on uh, these days. And Got to remind you, Harvey Kurtzman, you know, humorist, Mad mm-hmm. Magazine. It, Might have five entries on this list. But uh, very contrast, what he's known for versus what, these war, heavily researched, by the way, war comics. When like, I was he, first learning about Harvey Kurtzman, that was kind of like a big, like, whoa, wait a second, what? It, you know, this is the same guy? Yeah, it's it's mind-blowing in a lot of ways. Applying his art style to the covers of those war comics, too, is like a real cognitive dissonance <laughs> kind of thing. Because it's like the like rubber gummy yeah. Peter Bag <laughs> arms and stuff. But, like, that Jeep is legit or something. Wild. Number 11, E.C. Seeger's Thimble Theater. Uh, You know, here for Popeye featured in all of the examples Mm -hmm. here, of course, the character that walks on to uh, Thimble Theater and kind of makes it his own. Uh, The prototype for that. It's happened in several strips, but it feels like Popeye's kind of the one that stands out in my mind. The rigor is unbelievable because... It's not a four-panel comic. Like it might have seven panels a day sometimes when he's laying Daily out his stories. You know, there's one example of six panels. Yeah, so already bucking that four-panel kind of model. And we've looked at some stuff like like Masters of Comic Art and and, and some other books that that gave us dimensional details of like the size that these things were drawn. Huge, mm-hmm. extreme, like bigger than the field of view in our camera space. Uh, and he's turning that out every day and creating this, his own world. What we're seeing with all of these top 50 cartoonists are people who are really going all in and able to create their own idiom, their whole own yeah. language. Singular. Yeah, yeah like, like uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fully realized vision that we're seeing from all of the cartoonists that we talked about here today. I'm glad you say that because, like, I've been wrestling with how do you describe what he's good at? And and most of these people, you know, like, you see it in common with several of these entries and maybe all of them in that, like, he's funny, he's a great writer, the characters are all defined, he draws great, you know, and it's this, like, multifaceted tool set that they bring, and I think that world building is a good way to think about it. And and a uh, unique individual world at that. R. Crumb and Weirdo, so the uh, 81 to 93 R. Crumb comics, far removed from the underground, you know, exploring different themes, using different tools, uh, an artist who is not resting on any laurels, but continuing to push himself into a new direction, a new time period, a new market, right, with the direct market in the 80s. More focused comics. Uh, the stuff in the 70s and all that, he, he is just like kind of churning out pages and 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 spilling out his brain without I don't want to say much thought, but but just every opportunity that's coming along, he's he's taken and, and he's just putting these comics out there. When it's weirdo uh time frame, his output is slowing down. He's getting more focused on the actual drawing, doing tighter comics, uh and just being more thoughtful with his approach. This is like the proto like b- before he starts doing hup. And uh, kind of 
you know, bowing out in a way. I don't know if they mention it in this description, but I always think of the weirdos, those covers are just berserk. Oh, yeah. Like, no wonder he's slowing down. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I hope so. <laughs> Number nine, Binky Brown meets the Holy Virgin Mary, Justin Green. Uh, this was the first artist edition, amongst other things, but it was one of those early underground autobiographies dealing with religion, you know, sort of opening up what the undergrounds and autobio could be. Mm -hmm. Very personal and uh, putting that those personal ideas on the page for, uh, you know, I guess for the entertainment benefit of the readers. So important to get get my hands on this comic because I read about it enough times in interviews and stuff. I was a Harvey P. Card devotee and then Binky Brown would be brought up. Uh, the religious aspect is a piece of this, but uh, the, the the bigger piece uh, that he's exploring is his own obsessive compulsive disorder. And there's this like, you know, the Hollywood version, like the, this when you hear Karens on the street with their lattes talking about their OCD because they need to tidy up their closet. It isn't that, man. It's a very debilitating, harrowing thing to go through. I think a lot of cartoonists know exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, he was the first guy to kind of like put that out there probably before the term was even coined. Like it was just, you had a condition, you were touched. I don't know what the, yeah, they, right. they called that shit, but obsessive compulsive disorder was not a thing then. We started reading this list last week and we also did like the weird comics yeah, book. because this was in the weird book. Yes, yeah. I was going to say, and I've gotten those lists so jumbled up in the last <laughs> week now of like, when was now, Hogden Whitney in this? And it's like, this is maybe the only one that's actually on both lists. We, we haven't gotten too deep in like this kind of conversation, but like this, this is hugely historically important and it's kind of like day one for, for what sort of become what what comics are but like like how do you feel about just sort of like the quality of the work and the placement do you feel like the history is maybe giving this a higher place or do you feel I, like I it's a really yeah, it, good it probably work? i'm surprised to see it at nine but i have no problem with that either you yeah. know like there's a lot of consideration and they talk about this in this issue like how they put together these lists how they weigh them you know based on all the different contributors and so i i think the historical part it, it matters, you uh -huh. know, depending on what that history is, you know, because so much comes, so much comes out of this specific comic. Yeah, you know, exactly. like there may be no. better versions of this comic that are made after this comic, but this is kind of your template, and uh, you know, I think that is worth a few points. You know, I don't uh -huh. know how many. Maybe it should be thirteen or something. I don't know. These are like the discussions that were going on at like, oh, the journal I, offices. I'm sure. Uh, number eight, Mad Magazine, the uh, the initial twenty four issues of the comic book. Yes, and. Again, not sure I can add anything to the mad discussion. It's an institution. In a way, if you go, you know, autobiography and memoir and, and personal, uh, Mad Magazine's a whole direction that comics go. Yes. Um, you know, a genre almost comes out of this. I, I, but it's so much more than that. And, and I recommend anybody, like, if you can get your hands on those Russ Cochran hardcovers or just, you know, get your hands on all of these comics, uh, they, you write them off on your taxes and shit, man, because it is a textbook for comics making like Watchmen wouldn't have read the way that it did if these comics right here didn't exist and it would it's just formal it's formal stuff there's so much fourth wall stuff where all of Kurt, Kurtzman's experience on like hey looks and those one pagers where he's playing with the legitimate form of comics uh all of that sweat equity went into this comic down to, to the cover, like, we got to do a cover to cover of this, because the more he, he stretches his chops, like, the cover design and graphic design of that stuff starts to morph and change, and it's things we take for granted. The, these Ben Oda sexy-ass uh, sound effects, man, like, bleeding into the next panels, that shit is dope, you know? Think about as, like, somebody working on their cartoonist chops. You're working on, like, the most serious, like, well-researched, like like almost kind of like humorless comic at the same time as you're working on this like off the wall create like what a great balance like what a great career that would be if you just sort of had worked on two things simultaneously that were that far apart. This speaks to the education of the early cartoonists and, and illustrators where you're supposed to be able to do it all, and th this is an all star gallery, man. I think we remember <laughs> EC Comics differently if you remove Mad Magazine from history. Right. It it makes. It elevates a lot of those great illustrators into great cartoonists. And I think if you remove this, we would really think about EC differently. Sure. And and you, you notice it's the Her Kurtzman War Comics. It's the Kurtzman Humor Joint. And way back on the list, 
was the EC like horror comics, which Gaines and Feldstein would be mad at because they like the sci-fi shit better. Mm -hmm. uh, what Harvey Kurtzman did with these artists who could draw really, really well, uh, you know, in spite of themselves at times, he did turn them into cartoonists. He reined them in. Very, very focused uh, roughs were provided for every situation. And you, it's noteworthy when you see in Mad Comics or even in the War Comics when, like, say, Russ Heath does the Plastic Man Mad Strip. And it's Russ Heath like you've never seen him before. Mm -hmm. Totally reined in by Kurtzman. When you see the Toth War Joint, like, we've seen him do dog fights, but it was never paced the way those Kurtzman things are. So you could really see Kurtzman's hand. And, and then take a look at, like, a Wally Wood sci-fi strip and a Wally Wood mad strip or a Severin strip or, you know, Elder. Elder is all over the place. Like, Elder, like, needed to be focused because the chicken fat is, like, his default setting. It's so It's phenomenal. Like, let's, let's turn you to a storyteller coming out of that. Yes, I love that figure. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the head at the bottom of his his leg. So good. Number seven, Donald Duck, Carl Barks story. So, you know, mentioned him a minute ago. Barks, of course, known as the good duck artist until fans tracked him down and were able to put Carl Barks Yeah, no signature on any of, like, his, these were created by Walt Disney. And as far as proof in the pudding is they've been reprinted ever since. Yeah, like, like the EC fandom was, was early comics fandom. But the good duck stuff, like this was a colloquially like known and accepted term for the Donald Duck stories that weren't like the other Donald Duck stories. And this speaks to some of what I was talking about with adventure stories and, yeah. you know, globe trotting with these characters where it's like, yeah, ducks, fun, whatever. But also this. Yeah, high level. adventure. Yeah. And I mean, yes. this, this stuff, you know, was an influence on, you know, Spielberg and Lucas and like they own several of these like pieces and, and you know, Indiana Jones comes out of this and the, and the, it's almost how Foster stuff. Uh, with, with the, the sort of background details. And, uh, you never see the originals on our shores, man. But go to Holland, go to Denmark, go to Finland. Uh, and when you're trolling around those comic fests, you get to see these original pages. Uh, no lie, man. Slightly smaller than our drawing table. You yeah. know? Giant. I need to see those. Well, in, in, in Europe, this became like the default. This is like, this is like a whole industry b based around this style, you know? This approach. We talk about jobbers all the time. I feel like this is a guy who's interested in every story he's making in these. Absolutely. You know, it just feels like the, all the panels are interesting. He's given that that latitude. Like, I, I think he came out guns ablaze and did good work uh, in terms of Disney's portfolio of business licensing and shit. This is pretty low on the list. Right. Yeah. So go ahead, turn in your things. Make sure you get your deadline. Get your in deadlines. On time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Number six, six 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 Jules Pfeiffer. So Pfeiffer earlier on this list, yeah. we talked about his proto graphic novel. Uh, this is, I guess, his better known work. I found this in paperback form. Mm. I don't know where this was serialized. The voice. Okay. So predating the underground by a little bit, or concurrent with the underground comics that would have been starting to, uh, you know, be seen in some of these publications. Uh, a guy who you know, has an imagination that can't be constrained by comics. You know, we talked about some of the stuff that he did in his life from filmmaking, uh, you know, just a, a very full career. Still active? Uh, I, I think so. Like, like Warren, Warren knows him. Dude, did he write the, the, the uh, Jack Nicholson line? Uh, uh, Try vacuum. That's carnal knowledge. Okay. Try, try vacuum. This place smells like a coffin. Why don't you open a window? You're getting a pretty good pay for that bed you're testing out. <laughs> um, this this is like what you'd be reading like as you're sipping your coffee watching like young Bob Dylan before he's famous perform. Uh, it says like there's like some strategy involved. Like he, he wasn't getting play from, from, uh, from New York publishers and book editors and stuff. So he's like, I'm going to put my shit in front of your face every week, man. Cause I know you guys are reading some village voice. Yeah. Such a different, uh, like a different world where the drawing and the writing would be this person, you know, who could do, uh, contemporary stuff that could entertain adults with this. And it's like, 
they're integral. You know, you wouldn't remove one from the other. It's a very different, uh, very different cartooning model. Number five, Little Nemo and Slumberland, Windsor McKay, kind of a godfather for a lot of what comics become in the 20th century. You can see it dating back to 1905. There have been some magnificent collections of this. I bought the Sunday Press edition of this, which is like the full size broadsheets. Whenever I saw, I had no intention of buying it, right. and then I saw it in person and it's was very like, impractical. What is this? <laughs> you know, like literally, this art transforms itself yes. when you see it at that original size. And I just love looking at it and imagining, you know, 1910. Somebody's reading this on, on their kitchen table or something. Yeah. Uh, it's a whole different world, and yet it's pretty easy to step into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a dream comic. Uh, you know how much. It, it's per it's a perfect vessel for that visual imagination to flourish, and his does. Every single week, it's like I'm going to be drawing dirigibles flying over Manhattan this week. The next week, I'm going to draw giant chickens uh, stepping on top of houses and, and 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 punting them. That's hilarious. I was going to say after that, the bed comes alive, and now it's walking around the rooftops. Well, and, every and single you've, week, you've seen his animation work too. So this is a guy who who. Doesn't mind a little hard work. Absolutely, and 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 yeah, hard work, week in week out, doing this this kind of uh, rigorous work. Uh, I've seen the originals of these. They might be as big as uh, the the table that we're we're filming this thing on. Joe Kubert owned about four or five of them, and they were prominently displayed at the Kubert School, as well as uh, other editorial illustrations that he did, which were drawn even bigger. Yeah, he, you know, it's that first generation, which again, like, there's no template for what makes a comic book artist. So, Windsor McKay was doing animation, was doing all this different kind of art, was creating pages that really don't look like anyone else's pages, you know, even since then, despite his influence. Uh, I mean, look at the phenomenal architectural detail. He's great at that. It's staggering when you see, like, a work that is so amazing out of the gate so early in, like, an art form's history. Like, it does make you feel like, like, is it like lead in gasoline or like what is it that's making like us live in this such like a, like a fallen state? It's like oh everything was great and then it got worse over time. You know, there's just a, there is something that happened like with with culture. Like went went to the museum not too long ago and we're looking at like like the old masters. Like it's it's set up beautifully where you just like are are walking through history and as you're getting to more contemporary times, it's, things are just get more and more stripped down and and uh, there's there's even a laziness to like the most the newest pieces that are like at the Carnegie, you know? I guess it's like, okay, he's doing this super cool stuff. Like, and then like the movies get popularized and it's like, okay, that's a little more amount of my time I can use. And then it's like TV gets invented and then video games. And right. Then, you know, yeah. Yeah. Now, now like, like what else were you going to do? Exactly. Yeah. People looking at their phones all the time. Number four, mouse art Spiegelman coming out of raw magazine from a couple entries earlier. Uh, this I got when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, Pantheon, I think, published it. But it, it became a mass market, available in bookstores kind of book. One of those early uh, examples of that, you know, from, from 1986. And I think a lot of people, man, this would be the comic that they found as adults. Mm -hmm. And just, it blew my mind. Anytime people criticize this comic, I'm always surprised by that because I think it's so phenomenal as a comic. Mm -hmm. Um I can remember Gary Groff came to Pittsburgh and was and was talking. And he was talking about how like they found an audience with people who were interested in the Holocaust or you know in history or what you know whatever element that wasn't necessarily the comics part of the equation. And in my mind, it's like that's phenomenal. That's what we want. You know, you want somebody who's interested in this subject, and the book is good enough that it doesn't matter if it's a comic. You know, you know if, you, if you're interested in the subject, you want to read this book. That's the thing. Like, the subject matter is so strong. The story that he has to tell, this, like, personal, like, family story that is, is like, this, like, global story. And I think even, like, in, in that, like, Masters of Comic Book Art show, like, Spiegelman is, is so humble and, like, undersells to such a degree the actual, like, cartooning and the thought and, and, you know, and it wasn't really until I read, I think it wasn't Meta called like Meta Mouse. It wasn't until I read that where it, it occurred to me of like, oh yeah, this is like, it isn't just like this great story. This is like a guy who is using comics in such a smart way, like formal, it's formally interesting, which yes. I don't think, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, maybe smartly Art Spiegelman underplayed that aspect of it. Yeah. There's a lot packed in there and I definitely recommend Meta Mouse uh, for everybody uh, to check out if they're, if they're interested in this comic and, and it, 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 it sells sells the metaphor that he uses even further because of all of the kind of like 
Jew as vermin propaganda that was out there. Uh, right, it, it, com- just, it comes out of like a visual tradition of like propaganda. Yeah. You know? It seems very simple. It's very readable. You know, like I said, I read it when I was in high school and I had no exposure to any kind of experimental avant-garde comics. Like mm-hmm. if this were too challenging, I would not have been able to read it. Uh, but it was very easy to read. And I think that's one of those things where like he makes it look simple and that hurts certain critical evaluation of it because you don't realize what he's doing. You know, he makes it look easy in certain ways that defy exactly what he is doing here. I mean, it's a memoir. Yeah. It's historical. It's brilliant as a comic. And they're like the originals are like actual mm-hmm. size of the printed page or something. There's so much going on there. So I can't say enough about it. And I look forward to when we cover this. Yeah. One. The, the cartooning is akin to Mazzucchelli that like it's so smart. And, and that, like, being sort of unassuming in, in the surface and in the cartooning is all part of the strategy. It it fits perfectly in Raw. And I think yeah. of Raw as, like, all these cartoonists that are that are conscious of the 2D surface. They're bringing mark making. They're bringing all this stuff that's unique to them. That's all in here, too. You know, I mean, you can see in this drawing several different ways he's representing texture and value. And the whole book is full of that. So works for me on every level. Pogo, number three, Walt Kelly. I am not going to call Pogo a stinker, but this is the the comic out of this run that I relate to the least. Yeah, and it no, could be because it was hard to find reprints of it whenever I would have been looking. It was like my my parents really really dug it, and I think it wasn't even in our paper or anything. Uh, Jeff Smith as, dug it, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah, that's how you would hear about it, man. Yes. You Jeff Smith, uh, jo- John Burns, swipe the lettering, man, and name war like dude, <laughs> uh, who. <laughs> We're offending a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it like it it was huge. And again, like Doonesbury or whatever. It's like we're just not like the right generation to be talking about like the virtues of this. Thing. They like he coins a lot of his own like Oki Finoki and shit yeah. like that. And then I see this like malarkey. Like, did he create the word malarkey? Because there's <laughs> yeah. a there's a lot of that in these comics. You right. know, the yeah, dad, the dad with sandwich, language, like, yeah. like all that stuff. So I'm like, whoa, is he the creator of that? And this strip here is talking about it's um he was making fun of McCarthyism right. before that was like fashionable or or like when you might get the crosshairs yeah doing it like concurrently yeah uh, you know when that was a real threat yeah it's really interesting comics from everything i know about it it's just a matter of i probably need to uh commit to looking at those reprints and and giving it another shot another one of those cartoonists man if you you take a look at that crumb book uh your vigor for life appalls me um that where it's a collection of his letters and stuff And, and most of those letters are fandom correspondence uh, the, like Walt Kelly was like a, such a precious jewel to that generation of, of cartoonists. I can see that. This is also a time when funny animal was a popular genre. And, you know, you see that's what his cast is made up of. And you, and I wonder like he's maybe the alpha of the funny animal genre, uh, at that time. So it's kind of interesting, the context of the history of this stuff too. Let's ask him what he thinks of easy comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I feel like also maybe like the traditions that we came out of and, and the work that we gravitated towards is not Funny Animal. So Funny like, Animal is one of the hardest things I think to square with contemporary comics yeah. and where it's at. As, as broad as contemporary comics are, I think Funny Animal is still sort of the bastard stepchild I, I think of the, comics history. I think the Carl Barks Duck stuff, because there's such like an action adventure component to it, it was probably like a little bit smooth, like for me personally to get into as opposed to something like this. You know. Number two, Peanuts, Charles Schultz. Where do you begin with Peanuts? Kim you Thompson know? wrote this piece. Very nice. And, uh, you know, this kind of changed, I think, newspaper comics. Whenever this shows up, everything changes in terms of aesthetic approach you know, kids talking like adults, uh, human psychology being your subject matter here, as opposed to, say, adventure comics or editorial comics. And, you know, 2,000 papers it was syndicated in. I remember after he died, being, seeing those lists of, like, celebrity earners that are that are dead, and he'd be, like, tops of the list. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it went around the globe. You know, this was the comic that everybody could, could understand, could read, could get into easily. Um, and another guy who put 50 years into it. Evergreen subject matter. Uh, when Fanta started reprinting these, I would read those volumes. And after maybe, I don't know, one or two volumes, he's sort of, he's there. Like yeah. it, it gets yeah, really gets strong there, pretty yeah. quick. And that was the thing to read at night. You know, I say Calvin and mm-hmm. Hobbes is a great medicine. Man, Peanuts for decades, you can get that kind of stuff out of it. Maybe not quite as happy as Calvin <laughs> yeah. and Hobbes, but it's still just, there's a life in it that, that 
transcends comics. Yeah, look, it's look a, how cute baby Snoopy is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a piece in here where Kim Thompson is describing like the introduction of characters Linus. as 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 babies, and then they grow to be the same age, mm-hmm, like, right. like yes. Charlie Brown's Evergreen, and uh, how it's like wood shedding the characters because you know he's already had like his experience with with Charlie Brown and he knows that he's going to codify these characters into something so they start off as like these little infants and then they grow to be part of the cast and become like this iconic thing the wobbly line is something that i love me too yeah. uh, you know, that it, was our time right like it, i was right. reading that yeah, stuff when i was delivering papers that and that's how he drew there, and i always thought that was beautiful there are these things that uh that i an extension we should probably like keep in mind as as we as we you know enter the golden years of our our lives and stuff like that and keep that kind of thing in mind. Uh, there's that Tezuka documentary where he is talking about like oh, all of my characters are based off a circle and I can no longer draw a circle. I have a shelf full of uh, late period Osama Tezuka comics. They're fine. They're yeah, right. They're yeah. great. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm very happy uh, with them. There there are different periods of the wobble. I think there was even a, a piece like at the uh, Billy Ireland where it's like the early 80s uh, where there's like a rhythmic, and I, and I am not making fun of whatever he had that made him do that. Um, there is a rhythmic sort of jitter to the hand that looks like 8-bit graphics. It's mm-hmm. like yeah. so perfectly rhythmic where it looks like pixel art. And, you know, we grew into into this thing. We, uh, like, I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but, like, we all watched that, like, Gil Kane interview yeah. video. And he's talking about, like, okay, you know, comics has, like, outlasted its, like, usefulness, you know, from, like, a, like a business standpoint or whatever. So all that's left is um, idiosyncrasy. If you have idiosyncrasy, then that that is, like, a saleable thing. And, and here, this is it. It's idios- idiosyncrasy. And when someone is enjoying someone's work, whether it's, like, a singer or whatever, like... The essence is just sort of spending time with that person as a person. The plot doesn't matter. The art doesn't, you know, the story, like you don't, you just remember the essence. And like, I feel like that, you know, Tremor is a little bit of Charles Schultz, you know, like us spending time with him and and like experiencing his soul or whatever. Yeah, I don't think I can add anything to that. Phenomenal. And number one, Crazy Cat, George Harriman. Uh, we've looked at a little bit of George Harriman on this on this show. I I I find it to be a magical comic. It's on my radar because of this list. Uh, I probably wouldn't have been patient enough to stick with it and to try to read it again and again if not for this kind of uh, exposure. A Tom Spurgeon write up on this one, which is lovely. Um, uh, uh, comics define comic in a lot of way because it's repetition. It's the same. It's the same story in in every single strip. And in that is where you get comparisons to music and playing it over and over. I would add, like, information is is communicated that way. The way we clarify meaning and what we say is by sort of repeating it in different ways, adding information. And that's what this strip does to the point of, like, that's how these characters become characters. It's from seeing them going through those motions and, and little variations each day. And Harriman, the reason he's on this list at this ranking is because he was up to the task of, yeah, I can draw that for 30 years and make it interesting every single time and vary it and find new ways to say this thing. And the subject matter is love. You know, it's these characters and, and how they express their love for one another. So there's all this fascinating. Other, yeah, there's all this other metaphorical stuff that Spurge puts in there where it's, it could it could uh, be meditations on art. Like, it's not right. about, like, loving the characters, but it's about, it's about art criticism. And he's a contemporary of... Picasso and James Joyce, where when art is starting to push those kinds of boundaries, where it's not about straight narrative in prose any longer, but we're going to get complex with it. Uh, it's not about representing the figure like we've done for fucking a thousand years. We're going to start playing around with things with that also. When you look at the line quality, uh, you see how that is a prototype for like a generation of cartoonists to have that kind of kinetic, fast, funky line. Uh, did you get that Tashin I did. Uh, uh, collection of Sundays every Sunday? Didn't start off quite this way, man. Like it was a pretty traditional, like twelve panel grid or sixteen panel grid, something like that. Very focused. Uh, he did a lot of focused comics before this. You know, he had a whole career essentially before doing this damn thing. Uh, and then he, when you see him start to get comfortable, start to inject like a little triangle shape panel, a couple circle panels and stuff like that, man. That's when he really starts singing. 
you know, number one, that's a, that's like a crazy spot for anything. Like, you know, try, trying to think of like, what else would you put in number one? Like this, I was surprised that this was the pick, but also it's like, yeah, like, I don't, I don't know what else. And it's like, this, this is one of those things where, okay, there used to be the argument is comics an art form. That's been settled. Yes, of course it's an art form. But then another question is, okay, has anyone created anything within that art form that you would call like art or great art, you know, something you could put along to, and, and this like forever for, for as long as both of those conversations have been going on that, this is one of the things that, that people would point to as like this, this is, this is great art. This is something you could put like this comic, you know, should hang in whatever, you know, like the museum of our imaginations next to like whatever, you know, whatever else would be there. This is an interesting mark here, Tom, especially with you here, because I, I see this in some of Kirby's 70s <laughs> yeah. work. And this is not uh, atypical for Harriman and Crazy Cat. Like, you'll see these kind of marks. And he lived in the desert southwest, uh, the American desert southwest. And so, like, some of these landscapes are clearly influenced by that landscape. Yeah, like American Indian. Yeah. Right. And I wonder about, like, some of these marks... They're so interesting. They're, they're, mm -hmm. They seem abstract on the page, but you can find them in different pieces of art throughout history and other cartoonists or, or other artists. And, uh, and it's kind of interesting to see those worked in, almost like they mean something, uh, almost on a, uh, I don't know, a like human a scale well, yeah. or something. We're, you know? we're looking at like an artist who is like really digging deep into the collective unconscious and, and like what's, what's at the base of, of, of his like imagination or his being. And that's what's there. And you see those kind of marks... Uh, they're kind of like global. There's like, you know, civilizations that, that did not make any contact that are, you know, as far as we know, that are making like similar kind of marks. So yeah, it might be something like just deep in our programming. Speaking to the art, man, like I think this is pen. Yes. And man, like I just imagine that like the fibers of the paper just get kicked up because this is a heavy hand just if slashing the originals. Pages. Like you'll see them just scratch to, to hell. That The, the surface is ruined. Um, the, the, besides the Tashin oversized collection of the Sunday pages, there's also a Sunday Press oversized collection of Sunday pages. If you can read these things at full size, I'd highly recommend it because it is pen work. You know, it yeah. does shrink. You know, like it's very detailed in a lot of ways. The other advice I would give everybody is this isn't reading a graphic novel. Like no. The goal is not to read strips one through 200 right. as fast as you can. Read three of them in a day and, and then reread them. You know, if, if you want to read some more that day, read a couple of them and, and just really let them sit with you. Uh, that was the big breakthrough for me is when I really became a fan, when they kind of unlocked. And they, they mentioned that in, uh, in this piece, they, they mentioned that in the, uh, the little Nemo piece as well. Like don't, don't, this isn't a comic book. You burn this, out your pleasure centers. If you're not careful, <laughs> these things came, came out once per week. And that was the delivery mechanism that they were supposed to be read. Yeah. Wow. Oh man. Great stuff, Ed. I love this list. I'm glad that we decided to do it. And who knows, maybe we'll do a part three someday uh, in the future where we look at some of the artist lists. Well, you know what? Uh, we got to put together the cartoonist kayfabe top 100 <laughs> greatest comics. And, and, and I think when people put together their like greatest lists, part of the intent is to like piss people off. So sure. kind of keep that in mind. Oh, I mean, like, uh, <laughs> that's what it's, sells it. It's know? the internet. Like, yeah. <laughs> like no matter what, what, uh, you share an opinion. There are enough people out there with an opposite opinion. And if anybody's interested in the contributors to this list, here is your breakdown for the initials as well as everyone's name that contributed to uh, putting this list together. So hats off to them. Not an easy task. And uh, I'm not eager to do my top 100, Tom. <laughs> I don't think it's easy. <laughs> well, but it's, a a really cool, it's a really cool document. It's certainly a great place to uh, you know find some new comics, but also to argue about this stuff and talk about what didn't make the list. So pretty cool issue. And, uh, you know, I'll celebrate Tom Spurgeon for really uh, having a vision here and putting together a very difficult issue. I agree with all of that. But listen, man, we got to get out of here because we have to unpack this Don Simpson Top 12. Uh, <laughs> not in a particular order. K favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on Patreon.com slash Jim Rug, where you can see some of the comics that I like, maybe not in ranked order. You can see uh, all of my original art process scripts, how I put together the comics I do. And you can download download some of my out-of-print zines and collections on there. I have about a dozen of those to download when you join patreon.com slash jimrug. 
Um, I was pretty quiet during the Fantastic Four part. <laughs> so if you want to find out what I think about the Fantastic Four, check out Fantastic Four Grand Design and uh, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Red Room Comics out there in the wild. Three issues on the stands as we speak. The fourth issue comes out September 1st. Thank you guys for making the fourth issue even more popular than the second. Uh, super stoked on that stuff. Order those comics at your local comic shop. Get them put on your pull list. Uh, go to the Fantagraphics website. Get them while they're hot. We had to reprint issue number one because you guys were ravenous about that stuff. If you want to read the comics before they hit paper, go to my Patreon. Patreon.com slash Ed Piscor. Three bucks for the archive there. And you can uh, read more than uh, five issues worth of material as we speak. All, all those links in my link tree in the description below. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. All right, man. i got to go read the Captain America trilogy by Steranko. <laughs> Jim, give them the marching orders. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics.